one thing about 100,000 troops massing in such a small area. I mean, they do make a hell of a target. If I was a Russian part of it, I would be absolutely terrified. This is an interesting story sort of developing at the moment. 100,000 in uh, looking to uh, focus on Kharkiv. Uh, Kupiansk in that area uh, is receiving 500 artillery shells a day. So the Russians seem to be focusing there. But if you look at the, the rest of the line, really from west to east, um, it would appear Ukrainian military making progress in the Dnipro Delta, which would be a potential crossing point. Also in Zaporizhia Oblast, again, they're making uh, progress. And of course, Bakhmut, which is uh, a little further south than Kharkiv, they're making great gains. And Bakhmut is, is, although it's not strategically important militarily, politically, it's massively important. And the amount of manpower, you know, particularly the Wagner group expended trying to take Bakhmut over the winter, they're going to lose it. So I... Uh, I'm not overly convinced that there are 100,000 troops waiting to go into Kharkiv, and it doesn't really make an, an awful lot of military sense. I think this is part of the propaganda, as we've seen in this war, the disinformation and propaganda coming out of Russia is, is an unbelievable torrent of rubbish, and it's trying to sift through it. I think there's a lot going on in the front line, and uh, the... One, one thing about 100,000 troops massing in such a small area, I mean, they do make a hell of a target. If I was a Russian part of it, I would be absolutely terrified because we know how accurate um, the Ukrainians are, their precision weaponry. Um, un undoubtedly, NATO are providing them with a lot of good intelligence. Undoubtedly, the UK and the US are. So if I was those 100,000 troops, knowing that the Ukrainians now had cluster munitions, um, I'd be terrified. But of course, you know, the Russians can't, as I said in my piece in the Telegraph, you know, the Russian, the way they do it, the officers are behind the soldiers. And if the soldiers turn around and, you know, don't want to fight, they get shot. Um, so these poor kids are in an absolutely terrible position. Yeah, it must be horrific for them. But, uh, you know, when it's all over, those people in, in the Kremlin... Uh, need to pay for it. I mean, Putin is already an indicted criminal at the International Criminal Court, and many others will follow him, I expect. I think what, what Ukraine is doing in Crimea is, is what we call preparing the battlefield. They're doing a lot of deep ops, cutting off the curse bridge, cutting off the logistics supply, a lot of barracks on fire, army barracks in Crimea. Thousands of people have, have been evacuated. Troops massed in barracks, you know, provide very, very good targets. So, you know, if that's a mobile reserve, and I think, you know, all around Crimea, you know, Russia is telling everybody to go on holiday there and go through a war zone to get there. Um, you know, these are these are the rich elite who are going to Crimea because they can't go to Europe. And uh, they're now seeing this at first hand. So I think it's no mistake that um, that Ukraine is focusing on that, focusing on key targets um, so that, you know, really breaking the resistance. And they've got the, th the thick line of the entrenched troops that we've mentioned already. But once they're through that, I think, you know, there is very little stopping going all the way to the Kurtz Kirsch Bridge and, and, and retaking Crimea. So very, very, very deliberate operations. And of course, the other thing that we know is that um, cluster bombs are now in the hands of the Ukraine and cluster bombs focused on those 100,000 troops around Kharkiv and elsewhere could be absolutely devastating. I think what, what's been really interesting on the casualty figures, um, the Medusa Russian independent uh, media site published a couple of days ago, um, is, uh, you know, 50,000 dead so far in the conflict, 750,000 VSI very seriously and is not coming back to the battlefield. Uh, Russian official figure is 6,000. Um, the key elements here are we're pretty certain that the elite forces were killed in the first couple of months of the conflict, which has left tens, hundreds of thousands of conscripts barely trained uh, and, um, and barely armed, you know, helmets, body armor and a rifle. What this means is if you only give somebody a week's training, there's very little that you can expect them to do, especially in a sort of combined arms 
tanks, infantry, aircraft type of manoeuvre. So the way the Russians are fighting at the moment is very static, trench-type warfare, just hundreds and thousands of young men uh, sitting, soaking up uh, basic Ukrainian bullets. What, what this also means is they can't manoeuvre. They don't. They don't seem to have seem to have a strategic reserve. We, we'd expect them to have divisions of armour, uh, that's tanks and armoured vehicles in the back, being able to nip across to wherever the pressure is. They they, they don't have that. The only way that they can do it is just throw uh, more manpower at, at the problem. Now they seem to have limited, unlimited amounts of manpower, but it is only this week that the Russian public have suddenly been hit with these figures. Now, admittedly, most of these conscripts are are convicts. Uh, they are ethnic minorities from the East. They're not from the vocal elite in Moscow and St. Petersburg. But people are now beginning to talk about it. There's a lot on Russian social media about, you know, how bad things are. And uh, you, one just can't imagine that um, you know, even a place like Russia can sustain you know, losing a thousand men a day. Um, eventually, they're going to have to start getting people from Moscow and St. Petersburg. So, yeah, I ultimately, as a lot of people said, the Russian uh, position is is untenable. It will break at some stage, but hopefully, um, without the massive loss of Ukrainian casualties and drawing this out um, even longer, it's very difficult to see how how they would adapt. Um, it's taken the Ukrainians three or four months to train their forces to do what we call combined arms manoeuvre. Uh, that is moving around the battlefield rather than just being static. Uh, we've seen the, the way that uh, uh, a lot of their senior leadership ha has now gone, disappeared. You know, General Sorovkin, who is the architect of the war in Ukraine. In fact, I saw him at very close quarters in Syria over the last four years. Um, where his policy of, of attacking schools, hospitals, infrastructure really is what we saw in the early part of, of the war in, in Ukraine, and we're, we're still seeing. Now, he's gone. Uh, even some really high-quality infield commanders like Popov, um, you know, ranted and raved last week about how poorly they're being supported, and he's gone. And, and what's left, it's... The Russian high command, Shaigu, the defense minister, Grasimov, these are what we'd call desk jockeys. These, these are not, you know, they've got loads of medals, but their medals are not for fighting, you know, in, in, in a war type of thing. So, you know, almost you've got military politicians trying to direct things. Putin gets very heavily involved himself. He's a spy. He doesn't really understand about this. So very difficult to see how they can change their tactics in any demonstrable way. Um and, you know, they're, they're, we know they're running out of precision weapons. They're even taking nuclear warheads off missiles and putting conventional ones on. So it's not as though they can up their, their precision strike. Um, they seem to be running out of those. So it's difficult to see that they would change. And um, if the Russian population continues to stay silent, then they can probably elongate this war a bit longer because they've got so many people to throw into the meat grinder. But um yeah, it, it, it can't go on forever, that's for certain.